in one building, I, I think that's why you may get a haunting. Something just brushed the back of my neck. two year history of the jail itself, you had 12 people that attempted to, to end their own lives. Some were successful, some weren't. When we you know, dive deeper into this history and unveil these stories, we can speak for those without a voice. Yeah. Those that are no longer here. Dillinger was only there from January of 1934 to March of 1934. This jail was a jail for 92 years. We are not focusing on John Dillinger, his one month of imprisonment and, at the jail. And let's be honest, Dillinger escaped. Yeah. Why would Dillinger go back to this jail? No. We'd probably have better luck standing in the alley outside of the Biograph Theater looking for Dillinger. I know that we're talking about the suicides and we can tap into that stuff later. But the murderers, I see uh, a brief section here of the murderers that you found. What events need our attention? Uh, George Chisholm. What's his story? He drowned his two sons in 1928. Both of his sons? He tied them together and made them jump into a harbor. And he sat there and watched them drown. Locally? Uh, yeah, Indiana Harbor up in Gary. Oh my God. Took them down to the harbor and tied their hands together, then tied the two boys together and told them if you exact words, if you jump in the water, you'll get to see your grandma. That's so sad. Yeah. The final story of the murderers that we, I would like to talk about is Anna Cunningham. Sure. Now, she was originally arrested and sent to jail for killing her one son. She poisoned him with arsenic. She only got caught because one of her other sons was in the hospital with arsenic poisoning. He ended up living. But investigators started thinking, hmm, this is strange. This guy, David Cunningham Jr. was his name, the one that got sent to the hospital and lived. Yeah, the so, first son that was poisoned? He was the, uh, he was actually the last son that was poisoned. Oh. And that's what triggered the police onto her trail was the poisoning of David Cunningham Jr. So they got to looking at it and uh, they figured out that Walter Cunningham died in 1923 of arsenic poisoning. Her other son, Charles Cunningham died of arsenic poisoning. What a horrible person. In 1921, her other, other son, <laughs> Harry Cunningham, he died. From the same thing? Mysteriously. He just mysteriously died. The information I was able to find, it just said he just randomly died. In 1919, her 28-year-old uh, daughter, Isabel Cunningham, died of meningitis. In 1918, her husband, David Cunningham, senior, dies from basically at the time in 1918 Crohn's disease. Stomach. Stomach, colon. So what year did she go to the Crown Point Jail? 1925. Did she freak out there? Like, how, what did she do with all of this rage that she had? It really wasn't rage, I'd say. This Anna 
and George Chisholm are two peas in a pod, I think. She had a surviving daughter. May, May, May. Cunningham. Yep, there you go, May. So May would say that mom would go crazy and chase him around the house with a butcher knife. And they'd, all the kids would have to gang up on her and get the knife away from her and she'd just like snap out of it. Right here it says that she would collapse and then go read the Bible for hours. So I came, I came here to the jail in late 2009. I came in for a regular tour. Um, I'd never been in the jail before and I grew up, you know, in Crown Point, never been here. So I came on a regular tour and I fell in love with the place and I volunteered as a tour guide. So I came in here quite a bit and honestly, I wasn't here very long um, doing those tours and started to realize uh, just the energy that you can feel when you're in here sometimes and the history behind that energy. And I think that's more when I started looking at it like, what if it is paranormal? You know, what if there is energies left here from the people that were here? And I think that's when I seriously started thinking about it as a place that may have paranormal activity. And um, I remember at the time I talked to the board about doing Ghost Hunt here as a fundraiser first, you know, and I thought it'd be fun. And I thought, you know, we can get groups in here, we can make money for the jail and do these ghost hunts and everybody would have fun. And that's what it was supposed to be. And when the ghost hunt started, once you got in here and you actually started calling these things out and asking them to communicate with you and talk to you, I think that's when we realized there is energy here and it does want to communicate. There's such a range of activity. Um, EVPs, sometimes we catch them on recording, sometimes we hear them with our own ears. We've seen white mists, black masses. We've seen full apparitions, emotion, um, feelings of headaches and nausea and sickness. We've had people pass out on us before. Um, it can be a negative place sometimes because of the type of people that were here. So sometimes you feel a lot of that negativity. A lot of times the day is actually more active when you're here during the day. We've had physical touching. Um, personally, I've experienced my own hair pulled during the middle of the day, just doing a regular tour or walking through and cleaning. Um, we've had things thrown at us things knocked down, and that's all daytime stuff. Um, nighttime, different feeling. The energy here moves from place to place. You can't pinpoint one spot and say, you know, this is the most active, because next time you go through, it may not be there. It may be somewhere else that wasn't last time you were there. I can honestly say that I've read newspaper articles and I'm saying these were probably late 20s, early 30s. There were inmates that were brought in here um, that technically didn't commit any crimes. They were awaiting transport for insanity. And some of the newspaper articles did mention that they talked about voices and hearing things. Now, you know, whether that was paranormal or not for that time, you know, I can't say. But I did have the opportunity to talk to one of the guards who worked here in the late 1960s and early 70s. And he confirmed that they had their own stories, their own ghost stories of when they worked here during like the night shift and they would do their walkthroughs of seeing things and hearing things that weren't actually the inmates at all. You know, I guess as far as story goes, I can confirm that he told me that those things happened in like the 60s and 70s here. So it's kind of cool that it was uh, when the jail was still in operation that there were things going on that maybe weren't explained then. Um, sometimes you get hauntings like, like residuals. Same thing happens again and again and again. And in a place like this, where somebody may have been locked up here for years, same routine every day over and over again, it has to leave an imprint. 
you know, and I, I think we feel that when we're in here. But again, you look at the people that were here and some of the crimes that were committed and reasons that they were here and then what happened after they were in here. This place ran like a typical jail. Homicides, suicides, um, there were fights, there were gang members in here. Um, a, lot of, a lot of negative stuff happened. So I think with all of that energy um, combined with the amount of people that were here and the amount of time that the place was open, you know, 1882 to 1975 is a long time and a lot of energy to be in one building. I, I think that's why you may get a haunting. So, Nick, now that we're at the Old Lake County Jail here in Crown Point, Indiana, and we're just starting our investigation, what would you like to do? So I want to cruise through the whole jail with just a digital recorder, live listening for EVP sure. on delay. It's a really good idea. Yeah, I just want to you know, get a feel for it. Uh, we don't have any meters or anything with us, and I just want to feel it. My name is Zeke, and I'm here with my friend Nick. We're here for the evening. Just letting you know that we mean no harm. We're just here to talk with you and hear your story. When I was about ready to start the interview with Sandy, who you know very well, did you make a noise on the second floor? Did you move a chair? I just heard something. What you got? I just heard something down here. Did you just make a noise in there? Could just be settling from the jail. I mean, it's an old building. This is the hub of this jail, man. This is where Dillinger stayed, uh, the story of Capone's accomplice and other rich characters that resided in this jail. Right behind you, at the top of the stairs there, is where the security would stay. And they would listen for walking in the hallway or the chance of any escape. Bats! Oh, it scared me, dude! Oh! Oh my oh, no, god! The bats. Ah! Dude, come on! Welcome to Crown Point! The reason why these doors are closed is because Nick closed them and we don't know how to open it back up. So we're gonna stand outside of the cells and see if we can conduct an EVP session. It's time to refresh our memory, so a lot of our research is jotted down on notes. The reason why we do this is because the history that we do is very rich and deep, and we wanna make sure that we get the names correctly. We're scared of misleading history, and we just really wanna to get to the bottom of this and figure out the next step. Yeah, I really just wanna get names, dates, events right because um when you do that you might increase your chances it's just you okay <laughs> felt like something was right here like reaching through the bars just like diddling my back so we're on the first floor down by dillinger's cell so we're just going to kick it off with some live evp so we're gonna ask some historical questions related to the jail and just see if we get any, any bites, as the fishermen would say. Hey, if I was looking to talk to uh, Martin Lane, which floor would I go on? I just got a really sharp pain in my left ear. Like really sharp pain right now. Walter Bennett. What's his story, Nick? 
Walter Bennett, you rammed your head into these bars until it fractured your skull and you died. So you're talking about suicide or suicide attempts. How many people, based on your research, killed themselves in this jail? So just off of the uh, published suicides and suicide attempts in this jail, I was able to find 12. 12 successful attempts? 12 attempts and successful attempts. Wow. George Catifers. Was he in this cell block? He rammed his head into these bars and fractured his skull too. I hear walking. Do you? Yeah. Where at? Did you hear footsteps in there? No. It was over this way. Follow me, get your camera. You know what it is? Quiet times at 11. That's a good point. We give you permission to make noise. I bet it was really hard during these warm summer nights to relax. Not only were you in jail, it's hot up here. There's no ventilation, no air conditioning, just you and your thoughts and sweat. We drove over from the state of Iowa to speak with you tonight. Do you know where Iowa is? I'm from Illinois. Do you know where Illinois is? Something just brushed the back of my neck. Another bat? No. It felt like little hands. Huh. Did you just touch me? I asked you a question. Did you just touch me? You wanted your sign. I think you got it there. But I think right now with the bars closing and all the restaurants, it's way too loud up here. Yeah, I think we should head back down and grab the spirit box and just make a bunch of noise to combat the outside interference. Sure. We just did a basic read throughout the entire building doing an EVP session. Not sure if we got anything, but we have a better understanding of where everything is. So what we're going to do is regroup real quick and get a spirit box and come back and see if we can connect history with modern day times. Uh, I'm sure all of you spirits know how this works. You gather around, manipulate this audio coming out of this speaker and tell us your story. Chisholm drowned his two sons. Did they tell you guys that when he came here? See <laughs> downstairs? What about Mac, who hacked up those three people with an axe? Hey, 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 hey. 
You remember that sound that I heard when I was interviewing Sandy? Yeah. I just heard that over that speaker. Huh. I want to know if it's this, like this bench moving, man. You moving this bench here? That's it. That's it. That's what I heard, man. There were people outside, right? Yeah. And they wanted to see it. Like they wanted to see where we did the interview. A little boy came in with his little sister and the mom and dad. And the second they went to where Sandy was about to be interviewed, I heard that noise upstairs. It startled everyone. And that's it. Man, I'm getting the chills. Are you getting the chills? Yeah. We're multiplying. And I'm yeah, you are. Losing control. Is George Chisholm here? He went to Michigan City, but did you see him while he was here? Big orb just flew up. What? It's a big orb just flew up off of you. Are you next to me right now? When you went into the side room, yeah. I was pretty much infatuated with that cell, like directly caddy corner across from me. I was just looking inside of there because there was a light on and now it's gone. This one over here. Keep, turn to your right. That one. This one. Yeah. I could see in there and all of a sudden the light just disappeared. And it's just pitch black now. How many children did you have? I just heard 10 and then I heard dose, as in two. Well, uh, there was like, right out in here, there was like a big orb that just kind of like did like a cinnamon roll, and then shot off. Can you see us? In here. Whoa. Do you want me to hang myself in here? From these? Dude! No, 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 I just heard keys. I just heard guard keys. I have actually full body chills right now, Nick. It's pretty cold over here too. It's the name of the guard that's on patrol right now. The cop, did you hear that? Is it a good cop or a bad cop? I have full body chills right now, Nick. Cops. Nick, I gotta tell you a story while we're here, man. I haven't told you before. Oh yeah? But... You're gonna make this weird, aren't you? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, the boy. first time I was here, dude, like check this cell out. First time I was here, it was about five years ago, right? I didn't know what I was doing. And we were up here on the third floor walking by and this exact cell right here, I caught an apparition. Do you see anything at that angle? I don't see anything remotely close to that, you know? I don't know, that was just something that was very strange. And I remember after that happened, I saw it during editing. It wasn't anything I saw live. Right. And I remember I got really dizzy right when I passed that cell. And I almost tipped over. I tipped over to my left. I got a really weird feeling. Like, I, did you see me tip over? Uh-huh. And, you know, it made me wonder if that 
manipulated my energy and my balance. When I interviewed her, I asked her if she had any advice for us, mm -hmm. and she told us to just let the building come to us. Maybe just turn that off and let that EVP run for a second, that digital recorder. Yeah. And we'll stand in this hallway. Right here it says that she would collapse and then go read the Bible for hours. And you know, this place, like I said earlier, this is the third time I've been here. Uh, the last time I was here wasn't a special occasion. Mm -hmm. It involved a lot of cops and a lot of fear. Um, and after I got home from that trip, it was two weeks. I just, I wanted to die, man. And it was two weeks to the day when I got home from that trip that I woke up to 15 scratches on my back. Mm -hmm. And from that day forward, I got my life back. And tonight, it's refreshing that it's calm and that it's peaceful because it hasn't always been this way. Mm -hmm.